Good morning. Very warm welcome to St John's this morning. Uh, really good to see you all and uh, good to see people joining us on the live stream as well. Thank you for being with us this morning. I'm just going to go through a couple of notices. The first notice is on Saturday, uh, this coming Saturday at 10 o'clock, we're going to be gathering to ch in church and outside of church just to give the place a good tidy, particularly sweep up leaves and uh, do any jobs that need doing in the churchyard and inside. So if you're able to spend a couple of hours Saturday morning, that'd be really, really good. So probably 10 to uh, midday, see how we get on. Also on the 2nd of November, Saturday, 2nd of November at three o'clock in here, we're gonna have a special service called Time to Remember. It's an opportunity, if anyone wants to say, um, remember a loved one, light a candle in their memory. It's just a short service with three hymns. Do come along to that and uh, there'll be some refreshments afterwards. Three o'clock on Saturday, the 2nd of November. I think that's all I need to say. Let's have a couple of uh, words from scripture. Revelation chapter five, the last book of the Bible. The vision that John the apostle has of the heaven. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. We have the great privilege of gathering here together in this building where people have praised the Lord for centuries. We're going to worship him today. So let me just pray as we begin. Father God, we thank you that we can praise you, our God. Thank you that you are mighty and worthy. And we thank you for the Lamb, Jesus Christ, who was slain for us. We thank you that we can meet in his name and we offer him praise. So be with us now in our service. Amen. And we're going to sing about the Lamb who was slain. From heaven you came. If you have a hymn book, it's 114. The words are on the screen.
To uh, sit down. It is really good to be able to worship the servant king this morning. Just going to say hello to people who have said hello online. Uh, we know we've got Jan Clark, Jane Knight, Barbara Yates, Pat Goodridge. I think we've probably also got Celia, and we've got others as well. So thank you for joining us this morning. I do know that quite a few people are struggling with uh, the bugs of the season and COVID's doing its rounds again. So we've probably got some people online because of that. But thank you for joining us. We're going to pray for the children as they go out to their groups. So Lord, we thank you for the children. We ask that you'd be with them and their leaders as they go out now to their groups. Please bless them and help them to learn more about our wonderful God. Amen. We'll just let the uh, children pop out. And let me bring up some words from Isaiah 55, which I'll read in a minute. So we're going to come and we're going to say sorry to God for all the things we do that are wrong. And we read this promise first. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will freely pardon. That great promise. Let's confess our sins now using this prayer. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the special prayer for today I'm going to read as a sort of absolution. It fits so well. This is today's special prayer, which I'll read. Grant, we beseech you, merciful Lord, to your faithful people, pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve you with a quiet mind through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So we are going to um, sing again, yet not I, but through Christ in me.
Please do sit down, and uh, Rob's going to come and read the Bible to us, which today is from Exodus 4 and 5 and into 6. This is a reading from Exodus chapter 4, verse 29, through to chapter 5, verse 9. And then again from chapter 5, verse 19, to chapter 6, verse 8. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had sinned their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave his, this order to the slave drivers and foremen in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the men, so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. The Israelite foremen realized they were in trouble when they were told, you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them, and they said, may the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Moses returned to the Lord and said, 
O Lord, why have you brought trouble upon this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to the Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble upon the people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of this country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they lived as aliens. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and the mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hands to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Rob, for reading that to us. Uh, We're going to be thinking about that passage in a few minutes. But first of all, uh, we're going to sing again from the breaking of the dawn. Again, the next also says, I will stand on the promise of your word, which we can. So let's stand.
Well, please do sit down. We've just uh, sung about how we can stand on every promise of God's word, but it doesn't always feel like that sometimes, does it? So let me pray as we come to God's word now. So Father God, we thank you that we can stand on every promise of your word. So speak to us now and open our hearts and minds and comfort us when uh, things just don't appear that way. And just point us to the marvellous promises that you make for us, that you have vowed on oath to fulfill. Amen. So I begin with a question. Uh, Have you ever felt let down by God? Perhaps you've prayed for someone and you feel the prayer's just not been answered. Or perhaps you've experienced in the past the wonder of knowing God and yet that feeling's just not there anymore. Somehow God now feels hidden. Excuse me. Perhaps you're wondering why, having given your life to God, you're not experiencing the promised blessing. Instead, life just seems to get increasingly hard. Well, we're looking at Exodus again, and it'll be useful to have it open, page 61, because in today's Bible reading, the Israelites felt just like that. Our reading began at the end of chapter 4 where Moses and Aaron bring good news to the elders of the Israelites. If you look at verse 31. Sorry, verse 30. Aaron tells them everything that God has said to Moses. And they even did some miraculous signs from God to back up the message. And it was clear God has come down to rescue you from your hardship. Verse 31, the elders believed. They worshipped God. Everything was now going to be all right. And yet by the end of chapter 5, it's a completely different story. The slavery of the people has not got better. It's got worse. So in verse 21, the elders said to Moses and Aaron, May the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. They felt let down. It's hardly surprising they feel that way. They'd been led to believe that God was going to deal with Pharaoh and the Egyptians. But it appears now that Pharaoh's still got the upper hand and his oppression of the people of Israel has got worse. Sometimes when people today share the good news of God with people, they make it out that following God's just going to be a breeze. They might say something along the lines of, if you trust in God, all your problems will be swept away. Actually, being a follower of the Lord's not always an easy ride. Don't get me wrong, in the long run, it is worth it. So worth it. But the thing is, and this is my first point today, things may get worse before they get better. When God acts to rescue his people, things may get worse before they get better. So we're going to take a closer look at the reading today, uh, chapter 5. It opens with Moses and Aaron going to Pharaoh and they say, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. That doesn't sound too bad, does it? Quite a reasonable request to Pharaoh. Not too much to ask, but look at Pharaoh's response in verse 2. Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. They're very significant words and we're going to come back to them in a moment. But let's look at what Pharaoh does next. Verse 4, the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. And then next paragraph, 
Pharaoh orders that the Israelites are no longer to be supplied with straw for making bricks. They're now going to have to gather their own straw in addition to making those bricks. And the quota of bricks remains unchanged. So really what Pharaoh is doing is doubling the work of the Israelite slaves. They thought it was bad before, well now it's going to be unbearable. And they thought God had come to lighten the load, so where on earth is he? Their first experience of encountering God is that things get worse. So we have to be honest, why why does this sometimes seem to be the case? Unfortunately, we can lead lead to all sorts of answers that uh, can include God's not simply, is simply not up to it. God's just not powerful enough. Or perhaps God has forgotten about us. He's busy doing something else. Maybe he, he's, he's a busy God. Think of all the prayers going on all across the world. He's off in Australia answering some prayers there. No time for me. Or maybe he just doesn't keep his word at all. He's not faithful. And the song that uh, we've just sung is just bunk. Maybe he's not real after all. So all these answers can, possible answers can go through our minds when we feel let down by God. It's hard to make sense of what's going on. Lisa and I were talking as we walked the dog the other day. Uh, we are talking about what happened when we started Breakfast Church. Remember when we started Breakfast Church? I know some of you weren't here at the time. It was in, uh, I think, the start of 2017. And we prayed about it. And we thought about it. And what we did on the third Sunday every month, we had two services. Traditional church, communion, at 11 o'clock. And then something more contemporary and funky at uh, 9.30. We had croissants and uh, coffee from 9 o'clock in the church room. And then we had some contemporary informal worship and a Bible message. We thought inviting people along to breakfast and chat and then move into a time of worship with a Bible talk was a great way forward. So we printed 2,000 attractive invitations. They even had pictures of croissants on, you know, to tempt people. And we put them in every household in Elmswell. We really thought God was behind it. Now, Breakfast Church, I think, was great. We had a great time. The congregation loved it. People on the fringe loved it. All those invitations, though, I don't think one person came. Not one. I know somebody did come along from reading it about it in the uh, magazine later on. But we just thought, well, where are you, God? We're trying to fulfill the Great Commission as you asked. We've prayed, we felt led to do this by you. And then, of course, shortly afterwards, COVID came. We shut down Breakfast Church. We've never started again. And, of course, the congregation shrank as well during COVID. When God acts to rescue his people, it may get worse before it gets better. It's just the way it is sometimes. So let's come back to the big question, why? And in our Bible reading, the answer why for the Egyptians was quite straightforward. One big reason why things got worse, well, he was called Pharaoh. Let's come back to verse 2 of chapter 5 and look again at his response to this request to let the people go to hold a festival to worship God in the desert. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. So the second heading today is when God acts to rescue his people, there will be opposition. Here the opposition is Pharaoh. Now think about Pharaoh, he, he, he believes he's onto a good thing. He's got a cheap labour force. He feels big and powerful, he likes being in charge. He's a top man. The last thing he wants to do is have this upstart God taking away his cheap labour force to go off into the desert. How would he look then? No way. And as for this God they worship, he says, who is he? Who is the Lord that I should obey him? I do not know the Lord. And there's a real sense of stubbornness. You can get the feeling that I don't want to know the Lord is really what he's saying. 
we're not going to be looking at chapter 7 to 10 in this preaching series. And next week we're going to jump to chapter 11. But the chapters are worth reading. And one big theme through those chapters is how Pharaoh continually hardens his heart against the Lord. He doesn't want to know who God is. And no matter how much God reveals himself through various signs, he remains stubborn. Now, isn't that just typical, though, of so many people in our world? As we go about the mission of God, we meet a lot of stubbornness and opposition. Quite simply, many people just don't want to know the Lord. And they close their minds and hearts against him. That's partly, I think, one of the reasons why the invitations to Breakfast Church didn't work. To many people, the prospect of getting to know the Lord, well, why would I want to do that? I've got better things to do on Sundays. They're worried that they might have to give up something that they enjoy. Opposition to, is to be expected. Lisa tells the story of uh, inviting somebody who appeared to be interested to a Christian event. It was a supper and then somebody spoke afterwards, a dialogue. And she then realised that this person she had invited actually hadn't come to ask questions. They'd come to, well not even debate, but to try and argue down the speaker. They didn't want to know the Lord. Opposition is to be expected. But we have to remember that we're in good company when we face opposition. It happened to the Israelites, and of course, it happened to the Lord Jesus himself. Do you remember the opposition Jesus faced? Even from the religious leaders who should have been welcoming him with open arms. And they went as far as crucifying him, asking that a murderer be released instead. We don't want God with us, we want a murderer. Opposition to the purposes of God is to be expected. Anyway, Lisa was saying to me as we were walking the dog that one day the penny dropped. Having felt let down by God about the lack of non-church people coming to breakfast church, she realised God was effectively saying, it's not you they're rejecting, it's me. We need to remember that behind Pharaoh stand the false gods of Egypt. There's forces of evil oppressing God's people here in Exodus. Likewise, every time we engage in mission, there will be spiritual opposition. And most of us remember Ernest, our curate, who was here for a few years. Before his wife came to join him uh, from Nigeria, she was in a prayer meeting in Nigeria, and she had a vision that in the porch of St. John's there was some presence trying to block people coming in. I'd felt the same in a different way that we'd just become invisible for the last year or so. Well, Ernest, being the sort of guy he is, got me to stand with him in the porch and we prayed and basically told, uh, in the name of Jesus, the presence to buzz off. And things did get better. We told that presence to buzz off, which brings us to, thirdly, when God acts to rescue his people, he will judge that opposition. So we move into chapter 6. Moses has now gone back to the Lord. He's brought the complaints of the people to the Lord. And the Lord responds with a most awesome declaration of what he's about to do. So chapter 6 verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God declares that the time has come to act and bring about. He's going to bring about this rescue, as promised. And in verses 2 to 5, God reminds Moses again that he is the God of his fathers. The unchanging God who's made a commitment, a covenant with a people. And he has heard the groaning and he is going to act so things are going to get better soon and then verse 6 he says I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment mighty acts of judgment they 
begin in chapter 7. And there's going to be 10 in all, famous plagues. And they're quite simply, uh, well, they're the judgment on, of the Lord on Pharaoh and the false gods of Egypt. Judgment on the enemies of God's people who are oppressing them and opposing their freedom. I say we're not going to look at those chapters. Just a couple of comments, though, about them. You know, the first few acts of judgment are almost a plea to Pharaoh to change his mind. Look, this is who you're dealing with, Pharaoh. Let my people go. But Pharaoh remains hard of heart. In fact, he hardens his heart even more. And so by the end of the plagues, they're clearly now punishment for his stubborn opposition to the Lord and his people's opposition. And another interesting thing to note if you read through those chapters is that after the first few acts of judgment, God's people, the Israelites, are protected from them. They're spared the effects of the plagues. But the most important thing to see is that the hardships that God's people have to go through are not going to last. God's going to sort it out in time and he will bring his people out from their captivity and their bondage. Now that's what's going on here in Exodus. But it's exactly the same for us. Jesus said in John 16 verse 33, in this world you will have trouble. But take courage, I have overcome the world. If we persevere, keep trusting in God, we will experience his faithfulness and we will be brought to the eternal place of freedom. Well, let's come back. I've got one more heading and this is in chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. When God acts to rescue his people, he makes himself known. They're great verses. I'm going to read 6 to 8 again. Chapter 6. Verse 6, therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know, then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. So God is making himself known through what he does here in Exodus. Do you notice how many times, well it's from verse 2 through to 8, he repeats, I am the Lord, I am the Lord. God's name is associated with how he acts. So if you want to know what God is like, look at what he does. And what does he do? He acts. By keeping his promise to rescue his people with mighty acts of judgment. The faithful God, he keeps his covenant and judges evil and oppression. And that's important because it's exactly the same again in the New Testament. The Lord is made known in how he acts through his son Jesus. And again, he shows that he is the faithful God who keeps his covenant. We can stand on every promise of his word. He shows that he's mighty. He judges evil and opposition at the cross. And also the cross reveals him as the God who rescues people from spiritual Captivity. We're rescued out of darkness and a slavery of sin into his marvelous light and perfect freedom. That's our God. That's what he does. That's what he's like. So, as we conclude, yes, things may get worse before they get better. We may face opposition as we become Christians or as we seek to live out our calling taking the news to other people to share with them. There will be opposition. It's to be expected, but this does not mean that God is unfaithful or too weak. No, in his time, 
He sorts it all out. Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, but take courage, I have overcome the world. So let's always look to that victory that Jesus won on the cross and in his resurrection. At the cross, all the enemies of God were declared defeated, including sin, including the devil, including death itself. And we know that because Jesus rose victorious over death. And when he returns, all those enemies are going to be cast into the lake of eternal fire. So friends, even if things get worse, be reassured, they will get better. The Lord has promised, and he is mighty to save, and he keeps his promises. So let's pray. So mighty God, make yourself known to us. Give us confidence in your promises. Thank you that you do rescue us with an outstretched arm, with mighty acts of judgment on evil, and that you bring us to perfect freedom forever in your place. Thank you for the Lord Jesus defeating all evil and sin and death at the cross. And thank you that just as he rose from the dead, so will we if we trust in him. Amen. So we're going to uh, sing in response. O church, arise and put your armour on. Hear the call of Christ our captain.
Well, please do sit down, and Linda's going to come and lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this day and for the beauty of creation, for the sunshine and rain, for the breath in our lungs, and for the blessings seen and unseen that fill our lives. Thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us and who gives us hope, and for the Holy Spirit who strengthens and guides us. As we gather here as a community of faith, we give thanks for the fellowship we share, the encouragement we receive, and the opportunity to praise you together. We pray for peace in the world. We pray for an end to the violence and war in the Middle East, Ukraine, and in many other places. May the current tensions not lead to more conflict. Instead, Lord, please guide world leaders to seek understanding and reconciliation. Just and righteous God, we lift up those who are oppressed and vulnerable in society. Shine your light on injustice and equality. Strengthen those who work for justice and empower us to advocate for the right and dignity of all people. We remember those who feel lonely and isolated. Surround them with your love and the warmth of community. Show us ways to reach out and include those who may be struggling with feelings of loneliness. May they find solace in your presence and the fellowship of believers. For the environment, Creator God, we ask that you would help us to be responsible stewards of the earth, inspire all to care for the environment, and work towards sustainable practices that honour your gift of creation. Lord of all strength, we bring before you all who feel let down or who are struggling in their faith. Strengthen their faith and help them to see your good plans for them and for the whole universe. And for all who are lost, help us to reach out with the good news. Encourage us to witness about you to others. Give us wisdom in the words we use and how we act. Show your mighty acts and bring many in our community into your kingdom where sins are forgiven and you are worshipped forever. Compassionate God, we lift up before you those who are facing illness and suffering. Grant them strength and healing in mind, body and spirit. Surround them with your comforting presence and the support of caring friends and family. We pray for doctors and healthcare professionals, asking for wisdom and skill as they provide care. Today we pray in particular for Margaret Hitchens, following the operation on her shoulder and ask for a speedy recovery. May your healing touch be upon all those in need. Finally, we bring before you those who are grieving the loss of a loved ones. Surround them with your tender mercy and bring them the, insur the assurance of eternal hope. Lord, hear our prayers and guide us as we seek to live out your love in the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now we pray the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Before the uh, children come and show us what they've been doing, we sing our final hymn in the hymn books. It's 643, Before the Throne of God Above.
Father, we do thank you for all that's been collected uh, here today and uh, in other means. We pray that you'll take all the money that uh, is offered to you and that you'll use it to extend your good kingdom. In the name of Jesus, amen. We've got the children coming in now, so uh, let's see what they've been up to this week. working hard this morning. Won't be just a second, we're missing a couple. <laughs> right. Well, hello everybody. Um, this morning in Sunday school, we've been looking at David and Saul. Uh, so the children had actually looked at a story last week and we've been carrying on. And we've been looking at the story of David going in to the camp of Saul because Saul was chasing David and he went into the camp when Saul was asleep and took his spear and his lantern but he didn't harm Saul and when Saul woke up and realised what had happened he was very sorry for the kind of man he was and asked to be forgiven by David for being such a nasty character shall we say and so they parted on good company. So this morning we've been making ourselves a model. As you can see, we have our campsite. We have David and his accomplice who went into the camp and they pin or pinched, they didn't. They took the sword and the lantern and they left the camp and left everybody else in peace. So we've been learning today that you don't have to be very cruel, you can be very kind. And we just let God take control and we just have to be the kind of person that God wants us to be and to carry on doing, being kind, nice people and not harming people. 
and remembering that God is in control of every situation. So I think you'll agree they've done very well this morning. <laughs> Oops, they're off. <laughs> and thank you very much. Thank you, Lorna. That was uh, brilliant. Well, do remember there's tea and coffee afterwards. But now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. So may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.